Now then, with a view to God's help, let's turn to the passage we read from the Word of God, the letter to the Philippians, and chapter 1, and the well-known words of verse 21, Philippians 1, 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now most of you uh, probably know that this letter was written from prison, and from the opening chapter, it's clear that the church in Philippi, probably all the churches, were uh, deeply concerned at that situation, that the apostle was in prison. And I think it's fair to say their concern was twofold. First of all, their concern was for the apostle himself, a man whom they loved and esteemed in the Lord. What was to befall him? How was he? And what would happen to him? These things concerned them. But perhaps even greater than that was the concern for the gospel itself. What would happen to the message? What would happen to the churches themselves if the apostle was to be put to death? And uh, Paul addresses these two things right away in the chapter. As regards the future of the gospel himself and Let's be clear that that's the most important of the two. Uh, What was Paul in comparison with the gospel? I mean, what's anybody in comparison with the gospel? As regards the gospel, he assures them that everything that's happened to him hasn't hindered the gospel being spread. In fact, he said, it has promoted the spread of the gospel. It's happened, as he puts it himself, for the furtherance of the gospel. That's how he describes it in verse 12. The things which happened unto me, brethren, have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. How? Well, he says in verse 13, my bonds or my chains in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all the other places. In other words, he has, he has got another opportunity to preach in places that he would never have expected to preach just because he is chained to the palace guard. So the gospel, in other words, is spreading uh, where you would least expect it to spread. So what happened, he says, has fallen out for the furtherance of the gospel. And I suppose in one way or another it always does. It always does. There are times when, like Eli Our hearts uh, tremble for the ark of God. But it is always ultimately in the Lord's hands. And he sometimes uses the strangest providences uh, to bring his own will to pass. So we should never be too cast down about the cause of the gospel. What we think is hindering it uh, can turn towards furthering it. The Lord can do that and often does. Often does. So that's as regards the gospel. Don't worry concerning it. But as regards himself, well, he says, in effect, don't be too concerned about me either. No, of course, it's good that they were. And it's a a good mark on us always as Christians that we are concerned for one another's well-being and concerned for preachers of the word and their well-being. But again, He says there is no need to be concerned. And he sums up why in these words, the immortal words of our text. There's no need to be concerned about me, he says, whether I live or die. doesn't really matter. Why? Well, he says, to me, to live, Christ. And to die, he says, well, that is gain. So either way, No need to worry. Living is Christ and dying is gain. Now these are great words. And uh, 
They're so plain in a way and so transparent that you almost feel like just leaving them alone and making use of them as they are. But let's for a few moments just seek to open them out a little and uh, seek that the Lord will bless that to us. There are, of course, two statements made here, not one. For me, or to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, both these statements are connected with each other. Uh, they actually uh, depend on each other. And in fact, you, you can't really understand one uh, without the other. They stand or fall together. To me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What I mean by that is just something like this. Dying is only a gain if to live is Christ. Or to put it the other way around, if you are not living in Christ, then dying is most certainly not a gain. So they stand together. To me, to live is Christ, therefore, you could say, to die is gain. So let's look at uh, both parts. First of all, to live is Christ. To me, to live is Christ. Now I think it's worthwhile pointing out at the beginning, it may be obvious to you, it may hardly need saying, but I think it's worthwhile pointing out that he doesn't say this as a preacher or as an apostle. I suppose there's a way in which uh, you would expect him to say it as a preacher and an apostle. I suppose there is a way in which a preacher and an apostle can say it more than anybody else. You would expect a true minister of the gospel to be able to say, well, for me to live is Christ. It's my calling. It's my life. It's my occupation. But he's not saying it in that capacity. He is saying it simply as a Christian, really. That for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. And in the sense in which he says it as a Christian, it is true of all Christians. It's a defining, distinguishing characteristic of all Christians that for them to live is Christ. And if we understand a Christian rightly, we will understand that for them living is Christ. For example, in the letter that he wrote to the Colossians and in chapter 3 and verse 4 he says this when Christ who is our life shall appear then we shall appear with him in glory Christ who is our life that's pretty much the same kind of statement for me to live is Christ Christ who is my life our life as Christians. So what then does it mean? Well, I think generally we could say that uh, it's a way of saying that somehow his whole life is bound up with Christ. His whole life is bound up with Christ. There are many things, I suppose, you can think of your life being bound up with. And in fact, when you enter certain relationships in this life, you can think of these relationships somehow defining your life from then on. I'm sure you know what I mean, but uh, just in case you don't, take the example, for example, of a husband and a wife. Uh, when a husband and a wife come together, uh, they are no longer two. They are one. And from that moment onwards, their lives are not really to be considered apart. They can't be considered apart. If they are living together as they ought to be, they are thought of as one. And as a husband, you don't think of yourself anymore apart from your wife. You are together. The same is true, of course, as a wife, of a wife in connection with a husband. I think we could say the same, probably, in connection with a father and a son or a mother and a daughter, in other words, when you bring a child into this world, that is a new relationship too, and it is a relationship that defines you, so that you think of yourself from now on like this. You are, from the moment that happens, 
a father. And you are a mother. And you remain a father. And you remain a mother. You never cease to think of yourself. As anything else. Well I think that's getting to. Where this is getting to. When you become a Christian. When you are born again. That is who you are. And it is what you are. In fact you are called it. You are called a Christian. Uh, His very name is in your title. It distinguishes you. It defines you. Something like what happens when you become a husband or a wife or these things. But of course it's deeper than that. How is it deeper? Well because the connection between you and this Christ is much deeper than it is even between you and your wife. And you and your child. Now these connections are so intimate. That it's almost hard for us to think of something being more deep. Than that. Than those. But this is. This spiritual union is so deep. And so mysterious. You are fused with Christ. Uh, The link between you and him is indissoluble. Of course between you and your wife. Or you and your husband. You are one. Until death do us part. But this is deeper than that. The apostle himself can say. This same apostle can say. I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And he does. When the Holy Spirit. uh, Entered into our hearts. He entered as a regenerating influence. We were actually. Really. Can I say. Can I almost use the word physically? Born again. You have become a new creation. Christ is in you. He indwells you. That's why the union is deeper than any other union you know. And um, I suppose even that doesn't do justice to how deep it is. He doesn't just indwell your heart. But he indwells your heart as Lord and Master. He indwells your heart as the one who directs it. He directs your whole life by his word and by the powerful influence of his spirit. So that you are entirely subject to him. And from the moment that he takes over in that position, you can say honestly... That Christ is the motive behind everything that you do. You do what you do that I might please him. Is that not why you do what you do? When you do it consciously, when you do it deliberately and definitely, do you not do what you do that you might please him? Is that not your motive? Of course, when you sin, that is an exception to the rule. But let the rule be what it is. Do you not live With the primary motive. Christ. And again. Is Christ not the goal. Of all that you do. Is he not the reason. You live. There was a time when he was not. But he now very much. Is your reason. For living. As Paul said in the third chapter. Of this very letter. That I might gain Christ. And be found in him. These are uh, great words. I count, he says, all things loss. The things that he used to glory in, uh, credits, he now considers them debits, loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and still do count them but dung that I may Win Christ. It's strange that as a Christian he can still talk about winning him. But that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness. But that which is through the faith of Christ. And he says I count them lost that I might know him. Isn't it strange that someone who knows him so well can speak of knowing him yet. But that's his goal. It's the driving force. Not just to please him, but to know him. 
and his power. If by any means, he says, I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not, all, not as though I had already attained or were already perfect. No, he says, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of by Christ Jesus. So he's the motive behind what we do. And he is the goal towards which we aim. So I suppose the apostle says, when he says that to me, to live is Christ, he is saying in effect that his whole life can be defined by knowing the Lord and serving him. Even if he's a tent maker, which he was, he's not a tent maker who happens to be a Christian. He is a Christian who happens to be a tent maker. That must be true of you too. If you're coming to the Lord's table meaningfully, honestly, as a true Christian, you're a Christian first and everything else second. You, much as you love your wife, much as you love your husband, the reality is that you're a Christian who happens to be a husband. You are a Christian who happens to be a father. You're a Christian who happens to be an engineer or an office worker. Even if you lost everything, if you lost every relationship you've got in life, if you lost every title you've got, it wouldn't fundamentally change who you are. But if you lost Christ, it would destroy you. Because that now defines you. He in you and you in him. You are no longer who you were. You are a Christian. A Christian is an amazing thing. It's not like being anything else. It's not like being anything else. It is all consuming. All consuming. Now for too many people, let's be honest, for too many people professing Christ, this is not so. It appears to be the case that too many people can say, if they were going to be honest, that for me to live is work. For me to live is music. For me to live is sport. Especially for me to live is football. For me to live is celebrity. Or even, for me to live is me. Me. And my trinity is me, myself, and I. For too many people, that's so. But if you are a Christian, for you to live is Christ. And if that is true of you, then you are welcome to the table of the Lord. But if it's not true of you, that your life is that identified with him, if he is not Lord and Master of all, if he's not in your waking thoughts constantly, how to please him and how to serve him, then it's better to step back and to ask What really does make me tick then? If for me to live is not Christ, what is it? What is it that takes the place that the Savior ought to have in your heart? He is Lord of all or not at all. Now if living being Christ is like that, I think we should be able to see quite clearly in what sense dying is gain. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Nobody speaks naturally of death as being a gain. I mean, whichever way you look at it, naturally death is a loss. It's a loss of everything, is it not? It's a loss of life, primarily. Um, But it's a loss of everything that goes with life. I mean, and that's everything. It's a loss of happiness, a loss of contentment. There's no positives about death, is there? viewed in itself. No positives at all. I know that people try to find positives about death. And uh, you hear some quite pathetic ones sometimes. It's quite common to hear somebody say if, if a person is in a situation where they've been in pain, suffering or distress of some kind, physical pain or mental suffering, they'll say things like, oh well, 
it was good that they, that they didn't really suffer long. I'm glad that their suffering is over. And for them, death is gain because it's just a release, you know. It's, it's a release from their pain and their anguish. But is it? Is it? I'm sometimes amazed, to be honest, at the people who say such things. People who ought to know better. People who profess that they believe very differently. People who profess that they believe in a heaven and that they believe in a hell. And they believe that heaven belongs to those who are in Christ and for whom to live is Christ. And they believe that hell belongs to those for whom living was not Christ. And yet they say, oh well I'm glad they weren't long in pain. What a foolish thing to say. What an unbiblical thing to say. Their suffering is over. But what if it's only just begun? What if at the very moment people are saying that, that very soul would give anything to be back in the pain of the deathbed? Because it was so much easier than what they endure. So yes, people say that death is a gain when it's some kind of release. But the fact of the matter is, there's no way in which you can speak about it as a gain unless you are a Christian. And if you are a Christian, then your death is a gain in a non-mitigated way, in a non-qualified way. It needs no qualification. It is just absolutely, totally, and simply a gain. How? Well, first of all, death brings you to be with him. Brings you to be with him. Now I suppose. Um, when you think about that. You might be liable to say. Well. Are you not with him anyway? And is he not with you? You've already defined. Living. In Christ. To be Christ in you. And you in him. And if he indwells you. Is he not with you? If you are in him. Are you not with him? Well, yes, that's right. But nonetheless, that doesn't take away from the force of the other words the apostle uses and the other thoughts that he brings before us. He very often emphasizes that in a vital sense we are not yet with him. In fact, he says, while we are present in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Who can say that but someone who knows that he's not where he wants to be? Who can say that but someone who knows that however present Christ is in him and with him, and he with him, however real that presence, there's still a chasm, there's still a divide. He is still absent from the Lord. And by faith he looks across that chasm. And he looks forward to the day when he will be with the Lord. For now he like you and like me, we're all enduring seeing him who is invisible. And we see him by faith. But we were made for something different. The medieval theologians used to speak very often about the beatific vision. That is essentially seeing him as he is. Seeing him as he is, really, because you are with him. And because you are like him. And the fact of the matter is that we can never be fulfilled un until we experience the beatific vision. I shall be satisfied, David said. Um, under the old covenant, I shall be satisfied when I awaken with thy likeness. And it was not merely the possession of the likeness that would satisfy him. But the knowledge that that belonged itself, that very possession of the likeness belonged to the, well, to being with him. To being with him in the presence of the Lord and seeing him as he is. And you look forward to that. You look forward to seeing him as he is. And um, you look forward to being like him yourself. You look forward to the day when hope becomes fulfillment, and when faith becomes vision, 
to be with Christ. And if you are a true believer, you'll know what these things are about. You'll know that even in your best moments, when you have the strongest sense, I think it's right to say, although, well, I suppose unless you've experienced these things, it's hard to say, but even with the strongest sense of the presence of Christ, you're conscious that you're still not with him. But you look forward to being with him. You know that the beatific vision carries everything else with it. Death is a gain because it will bring you with him. And I think it's worth emphasizing too that there is no time delay between living for him and gaining him. There's no interlude. There are some um, false teachers and uh, deviant sects that do teach that there is a long gap between your death and actually being with the Lord and seeing the Lord and seeing the beatific vision. They describe that period as a soul sleep, a long, maybe a vast period of aeons when your soul is asleep. Perhaps even some suggest a kind of bizarre temporary annihilation, which is a, a, a ridiculous postulate and certainly not scriptural at all. But the point is that in scripture there is no such thing anyway. According to the teaching of Scripture and the teaching of the Apostle, your death is immediately followed by gaining him, by gaining his presence. To be absent from the body, as he said, is to be present with the Lord. There's no gap between the two. I mean, if there's a vast gap, why not say so? The Christian who longs to be with the Lord doesn't want a gap. And of course he said, to the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross uh, didn't have such quite a high expectation. Remember me, O Lord. Remember me, O Lord, when you come in your kingdom. Uh, the thief was looking forward to the great resurrection. That day afar off. When you remember Abraham and raise him from the dust of the earth. When you raise Isaac from the dust of the earth. When you, raise, when you raise Jacob and Joseph from the dust of the earth. Remember me on that day. Raise me with the righteous. But the Lord answers exceeding abundant. Above what the thief asked or taught, thought. No, he said, today you shall be with me in paradise. I've mentioned this quite often in different contexts, and you may be familiar with it, but the Jehovah's Witnesses have a, have a very strange uh, punctuation of that text because they don't believe, you see, that you, that you immediately go into the presence of the Lord. So they punctuate that text very strangely. They punctuate, you can, I'm not urging you to read the New World Translation, but if you do look at it, you'll find it punctuated like this. Verily I say to you today, you shall be with me. In other words, I'm telling you today. The, the answer to that is, well, of course he's telling him today. Uh, but that's not the point. The point, you see, is that you are looking for something in the far distant future. But I'm telling you that today, before this day is finished, and there's very few hours left in it, but before it's over, you will be with me in paradise. And the point is not simply that they have a common destination, the point is not simply that they're both going to be in the same place. The point is that one will be with the other. Even as he was in close proximity on the cross, he will be with him in paradise. And that's why it's a gain. And that's why it's immediate. I mean, it's, it's not just the gain of being with him, but it's the gain of being with him right away. And is that not a thought? I mean... Certainly to be incarcerated in a Roman prison, fearing the sword of Nero, is a thought. But to know that Nero's sword would immediately usher you into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that transforms an execution. No wonder many a martyr became bold on the scaffold when they least expected it. 
Because they realized and they were given to realize that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they would be with the Lord. And how's that for again? No, there's no delay. There's no soul sleep. There's no interval. It doesn't matter whether it's conscious or unconscious. It doesn't exist. To be absent from the body at last is to be present with the Lord. So it's again because we're with him. Again, dying is again because we will be like him. How's that again? For obvious reasons. Since he first indwelt you, uh, that, was the, that was the defining goal of your life. Is that not right? Is it still not? I mean, what is the goal of your life? Yes, it's to be like him. In terms of experience, yes, you want to see him as he is. But what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Ah, you want to be like your Lord and Savior. You know that's why you were foreordained. That's why you were predestined. That's why you were called. That's why you were justified. Were you justified so your sins could be forgiven? Is that the goal of the Christian life? No, it's not the goal of the Christian life. It's some people's idea of the Christian life. People who don't understand what the Christian life really is about. Justification's their goal. They shout about their justification. Justification's all there is to it. But you see, a true Christian never sees justification as the goal. Justification is with a view to something. Justification is with a view to sanctification, which itself is with a view to glorification. You've got your eye on the end point. You know you've been acquitted. You know you've been reconciled to God so that at last you can be like God. So that at last you can wear his nature. You can be the kind of man and woman that God would have us be. That's what you want to be. Yes, as the apostle says, that we might be conformed to the image of the Son in perfect holiness. That, again, is what Paul was saying when he said that I may win Christ and be found in him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Um, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Notice, notice this sense of Can I call it a holy discontent? Hope that's not too um, oxymoronic to put you off it, but a holy kind of uh, discontent. Not as though I had already attained. I haven't, he said. Either were already perfect. I'm not, but I follow after. Why do you follow after? Because I want it. I long for it. I long to be holy. As he is holy. I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind. And can't we say that in a sense? Always. And reaching forth. Always can't we say that? To those things which are before. I press towards the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God. In Christ Jesus. And that is to be holy. Certainly. As he is holy. So to die is gain because you are with him and because you are like him when you die. It's not a wonderful thought. I mean, there's a sense, you could open these things out endlessly, but there's a way in which you can't add to them. Yes, you can say, if, if I will be with him and if I will be like him, I have gained everything. That's to gain Christ. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that he makes this statement, uh, of course, in the context of being aware, possibly, of imminent death. Or at least he was expecting an imminent death. And he, he imagines a kind of choice to be made. Supposing uh, you were to come to him and say, Paul, all right, um, if living is Christ and dying is gain... Which would you rather? I suppose I could ask you the same question tonight myself. 
Um, suppose you can say that for you to live is Christ and to die is gain. I could say to you, yes, very well. Both are true. You believe both. They are both true. But which would you prefer? Would you prefer to go on living when life is Christ? Or would you prefer to die because it's gain? Well, the apostle says that he's in a strait between two, he says. And that in itself is interesting. Uh, What I shall choose, he says, I wot not. The end of verse 22, I do not know. Because, he says, I am in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, is more needful for you. For myself, he says, um, I'm in a strait. Why? Well, because if I stay, he says, uh, that means that I'll see more fruit for my labor. I'm staying because God wants me to stay. And I'll stay because God will use me. And in his own infinite wisdom and condescension, he will bless my labors and there will be fruit for my labor. If I depart... He says, then for me, that is far better. Why? (laughs) For the reasons we saw. I'll be with him, and I shall be like him. But, he says, I can't just think of myself. I must think of you, too, as a congregation. I must think of you as people. After all, he was later to say in chapter 2 and verse 4, Look not every man on his own thing but every man also on the things of others. And that's why in our own text here, or in our own context, in verse 24, he says, Nevertheless, he says, although to depart and to be with Christ is far better, nevertheless, he says, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, he says in verse 25, I know that I shall abide. Now, isn't that strange? He knows that he shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. What he's saying there is essentially this, that through prayer and meditation, the Lord has revealed to him that he's got to stay for a while. His execution is not coming this time, and it didn't come this time. He was released only to be later imprisoned, and there was no release from that. But right now he's come to the conclusion that God means him to live. And he's happy with that. Not so much because he can still labor for the Lord in this earth, although he's glad to do that, but because they need it. He knows they need it. God has shown them that it will be a blessing for them if he's to live on and to stay. And he says, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. In other words, he's happy to be here, not because it's his own preference as such, but because he knows it's God's will and it's for the benefit of others. Now, is that why you would like to stay? I asked you a moment ago, or I said if I asked you, which would you rather? Would you rather to carry on living with Christ or would you rather to die it might be strange if you said to me something like, well, you know, I'm just, um, I'm happy with things as they are, really, for a while, and I, I'd just rather live on. Well, I suppose we were made to live like that, but maybe you need to ask yourself, why? Why? Why is it better just to live on? Why is it that you wouldn't like the gain of instantly being with Christ and being like him? I would suggest to you that you ought to have that as your preference always. I know that you have other concerns. I'm a family man myself, and you say, well, what about maybe my wife, or what about my family, and so on? Well, these things are true. Um, But God is their pastor too, just as he's yours. And in the the last analysis, uh, it's only if you know God wants you to stay for that reason, that you should be happy to stay for that reason. Our default position should always be, yes, with him, and yes, like him. With him and like him. Now we can find all kinds of reasons to rationalize why we might think differently. 
But the closer we are to the Lord, the more that will be so. The more we will be ready to say that to depart and to be with him is far better. It's only if God shows you that it's better for you to be here. That it's needful for you to be here. That it is useful in his plan and purpose for the benefit of other people for you to be here. It's only then that you should say, yes, I'll go on and I'll gladly go on because that is your will for me. Why? Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you can honestly say that with the apostle, honestly, if you can say to live is Christ and to die is gain, then you are very welcome indeed at the Lord's table. I'll close with a little uh, story that I heard a good few years ago about a Baptist pastor uh, in America. And uh, he was quite critically ill with a heart condition and uh, he was being taken in for a, an operation. And the, um, the doctor who was going to perform, the surgeon who was going to perform the operation said to him, well, he said, I have to be very honest with you, he said. It's a 50-50 situation, this. He says, You're, you'll either wake up from this or you won't. And the chances are 50-50. And the Baptist pastor looked at him and he said, well, he said, um, either way, he says, I win. Either way, I win. Why could he say that? Because for him to live was Christ and to die is gain. For you to live is, you fill in the blank. For you to die is, you fill in the blank. 